Well, let's take our Bibles. I have two scripture passages I want to read in preparation for the message from God's Word this morning. And uh, we'll begin in Luke chapter 19. If you would turn to Luke chapter 19, we'll begin reading in verse number 28. And I want to read down to verse number 44. And then we'll go across to the Psalms, to Psalm 118. So Luke chapter 19, if you found your place, I would ask that you would follow along with your eyes as I read here the word of God. And the Bible says, And when he, that is Jesus, had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount of, uh, called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never yet, uh, yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench round about, about thee and come past thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in the one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation." And then if you keep your place there, we'll be preaching from this text, but go over to the Psalm 118. Uh, Psalm 118, I'd like to read from verse number 14 down to the end of this psalm. Psalm 118, beginning in verse number 14, the Bible says, The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open unto me the gates of righteousness, and I will go in unto, into them, and I will praise the Lord. The gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we ask for God's blessing on the preaching and teaching of his word this morning. A wonderful heavenly Father, we do thank you 
for you are good and your mercy does endure, endure forever. We thank you, Lord, for your uh, giving us this day that we might assemble here in this place to gather as your children and to hear what you have to say from your word. We thank the Lord for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that we can have a, a, a book that is the word of the living God that we can read, not only read, but we can take it in and believe it and not only believe it, but Lord, we can apply it to our lives and live it. And we thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to hear the preaching of your word. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts, cause us, Lord, to, to set aside all of the cares and the concerns that we may have in our life, but Lord, that we would have open hearts ready to hear what the Holy Spirit would say through the preaching of your word today. Lord, I pray that you would use that to encourage us, to cause us to know more about your wonderful son, Jesus Christ, to love him more and to walk more closely with him. Father, we also pray that if there's one here today that is outside of the kingdom of God and has never been born again and received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that today you would show them by opening their eyes to the light of the gospel how they can be saved and that they can put their faith in you. Lord, we ask that you would accomplish your will in each of our lives this morning and we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen. I want you to think in your minds for a few moments, if you can, if you would, of the ancient city of Jerusalem. There that city, that holy city, is set among the Judean highlands there, and at this time of the year it is bathed in the freshness of spring. And as you think of this city of Jerusalem in your minds and try to contemplate what it must have been like, let me tell you that on this occasion, it is swollen in its population by almost three million people who have come as pilgrims to the city. Every inn in the city, every home, every shelter, every place where somebody could stay is completely full. There is no room left in the city. And as such, all the open ground around the city and the hills and the valley that would surround the city of Jerusalem is taken up with tents and shelters that have been constructed by the people. Because in four days' time, it is the Passover. And the people have come early to purify themselves, to prepare themselves for the, uh, the great festival of the Passover there in Jerusalem. And I can imagine this scene as the city was... Uh, overflowing and crowded with people, not only in the city but around the city, that there was a hubbub of excitement and anticipation. And coupled with that would have been the bleating of sheep. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that it would be typical to sacrifice at that time uh, 265,500 sheep. That's an amazing thought. And uh, you could just picture yourself, I think, there in that day. And then, as we look at the city, we notice that rising from the eastern side of the Mount of Olives, there comes the muffled sounds of a great host of cheering people. A sound is increasingly getting louder and clearer, and it is the sound of praise. Hosanna is the cry. Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, and blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. In Luke 19 and verse number 38, we read where the cry was, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And what we would be witnessing on this day in Jerusalem would be our Lord Jesus Christ making his royal entry into Jerusalem. That is what has been described for us here in the text. And as far as we can accurately compute, it was April the 2nd in the year 30 AD. It was a Saturday, not a Sunday. It's not Palm Sunday as the religious world would often celebrate. But really, if you want to give it a name, it is Palm Saturday. It was a Sabbath day. 
And Jesus made that Sabbath day's journey from Bethany into the city of Jerusalem. And this was our Lord's formal presentation of himself to Israel as their Messiah. You know, this was a, a truth that had been kept from the people at large. Jesus had not publicly revealed himself as the Messiah. He'd only revealed the truth to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. In John chapter 4, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He'd also accepted it in the confession of Peter, that wonderful confession that's recorded in Matthew chapter 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. That word Christ, of course, means the anointed one, the, the Messiah. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then Jesus charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. He did receive that recognition from Martha as he came to the grave of Lazarus. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And so there were a few occasions during his public ministry where he acknowledged that he was indeed the long-promised, long-awaited-for Messiah, but on this day he is publicly presenting himself to the nation. And that's what I want to preach on here this morning as we think about our Lord's coming into Jerusalem. And there are two thoughts I want to bring out, just two points to the message. Number one, I want us to look at the messianic credentials of our Lord. And secondly, I want to consider the response of the people to the Messiah. I find that this would be very, very instructive to us this morning, not only to understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is and to further our understanding and knowledge of that, but also to observe the way in which people respond to Jesus Christ. And maybe even here today, we would touch on how you respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, let's talk about the messianic credentials of our Lord. And from the book of uh, Luke here, the 19th chapter, there are four things I want to bring out about the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we see his divinity. We see that he is the Son of God. He's, he is God. And how do we know that? Because he demonstrates his omniscience in a very simple way, but a very profound way. Look at verse number 29 here in Luke. It came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage at Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never yet man sat, loose him and bring him hither. Now how in the world did Jesus know that? He knew where the colt would be located, the exact location. He knew the condition of the animal, that it was a, uh, one that had never been ridden upon. And he knew all about this. And we would say, well, that, that's not a profound statement, but the fact is he can do that because he's the creator. And uh, he knows the things that are going on in this world. He knows about every sparrow that falls. He knows every hair on our head. <laughs> he knows every burden that you are bearing. The Lord knows that. Because he is God and because he's God, he is omniscient. It means he's all-knowing. There's nothing that God doesn't know. And so on that day, Jesus demonstrates that he is God because he says, now when you go there, you're going to find this animal at the beginning of the city or the village, I should say, opening there and it'll be exactly as he said when they came and found it. God knows. He knows every sin that's residing deep within your heart. He knows every desire that you have because he's God. What a wonderful God we serve. Jesus giving the credentials here. Number one, we see his divinity. Secondly, we see his authority. It's seen in his instruction to the disciples in verse number 31. He said, and if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. It's interesting here, I, I could imagine, 
to be told just to go take a colt. That colt, that uh, ass, would have been tied up at the entrance to a home, perhaps just outside the courtyard, just to go up and take it. I mean, don't we call that theft? (laughs) Uh, Well, Jesus gave instruction to his disciples and we don't read about any bargaining with him. Uh, Lord, could you clarify that? Lord, do you really want us to do this? I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do. I mean, there was no questioning of the commandment that Jesus gave to his disciples. They, they didn't reason it out. They just knew that he is Lord. And if he commands this, then that's a command from the Lord. And that's the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, but we see the owners of the cult didn't argue. I could imagine if someone was stealing my car out of the driveway, I'd have something to say to somebody. But uh, when they said, why are you taking the cult? They they simply did what Jesus told them to say, and the Lord hath need of him. And there was no further argument. There was no further argument. Now, I think that these owners of the cult would have been disciples of Christ. There were several times when Jesus came down to Judea in his public ministry and he, he preached and, and did miracles down there and many, we're told, came to know him as saviour. They trusted him, they believed in him. And so I think we're looking at believers here, we're looking at disciples here, the disciples of Christ, who submitted to his authority in obeying his command without question and the owners of the animal who also submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. They certainly would have recognized his messianic authority. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And Jesus Christ has authority. And we as Christians have to examine our hearts and and, and say, well, what if I was in that situation? What if God called me to do something? What if God asked me to do something? And maybe it was a strange command, at least at first. Maybe it's something that doesn't compute in my mind. Do we question the Lord or do we follow the Lord in obedience? But I see here that his credentials reveal his authority to do that. No other man could have done that to issue such a commandment. And then thirdly, we see his credibility in two different ways. First of all, in this time when Jesus presented himself, there was a fulfilling of the Old Testament type in the Passover. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter 12 records for us the institution of the Passover. God gave it here to Israel Uh, to observe and I think most of us would be aware that the Passover is a type of Jesus Christ meaning it is an image of what Christ would do he is our Passover the Bible tells us that and he is the Passover lamb but I want you to notice the timing of things here as the Lord unfolds the instructions here beginning in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 12 The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month. Now underline the word tenth because that's key here. In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him, uh, his house, take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating, uh, shall make your count for the lamb. And and then verse number five, your lamb shall be without blemish. Now that's that's a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ, is it not? a lamb without blemish and without spot because the Bible says he is holy and, and harmless and, and he has no sin. Well, that's part of the type here, the Old Testament type that is reflecting uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats 
And notice this, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And then it goes on in verse 13 is this wonderful statement. We actually sing about it. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where we get the word Passover from. And uh, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, when he sees the blood applied to your heart, to your soul, uh, he will pass over you in divine judgment and uh, an eternity without Christ. What a wonderful blessing that is. But here we find that Jesus is fulfilling the type, and not just in a general way, but he is presenting himself to Israel on the 10th day of that first month. And four days later, on the 14th day, he would be crucified as the sun was beginning to recede in the sky at around 3 o'clock uh, then Jesus died in a exact accordance to the, the type overpass. Why did they keep that, that uh, lamb for four days? Uh, well, it was there for inspection. It had to be a perfect lamb. It had to be a pure lamb. And so uh, Jesus here in presenting himself openly is now, in a sense, fulfilling that part of the type, revealing his, per his perfections, his impeccability. Remember when Pilate uh, had tried to judge him, he said, I find no fault in this man. He was completely sinless and yet it was part of God's picturing here that Jesus uh, shows his credibility. He is holy and solely qualified to be our saviour. There is no man on earth who could fit the, the requirements for being a Passover lamb. And it's interesting that as those lambs were being slaughtered in the city... And that's why I said, uh, based on the figures of Josephus, uh, over 250,000 lambs were put to death, and you multiply that by the number of people that, that lamb would feed, you can see the city was probably well over 3 million people at that time. But as they were slaughtering those lambs and shedding the blood of lambs, our precious Saviour, the Lamb of God, was dying on the cross and shedding his blood. Amen. God keeps his word and he sent his son. And Jesus, who presents himself here, is uh, showing that he is fit to be the savior. He's fit to be our savior. The second area of credibility is in his fulfillment of divine prophecy. And for that, I'd like you to turn back to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is, the, uh, I think, the second to last book coming just before Malachi. And uh, Zechariah chapter 9, uh, there's a prophecy that was recorded here by Zechariah about 480 BC. So 500 years before this prophecy was fulfilled, uh, God said what would take place on this day. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9, notice this. The Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, meaning perfect. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Isn't that amazing? 500 years before it ever happened, God recorded it in his word. But you know, that's one of the reasons we know the Bible is the word of God. Because it's not just prophet, this prophecy, it is a multitude of prophecies that were fulfilled perfectly and exactly in the person of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So just in this simple moment of time, as Jesus uh, gave the command, we see his divinity and his knowledge of what would be over the hill as they came to Bethphage, the, the house of figs, and they would find it exactly as Jesus said. And we see his authority in uh, his command being uh, followed without reservation. And we see his credibility in fulfilling prophecy and fulfilling the types of the Old Testament. But then we also see in this scene his humanity, his humanity. Uh, for a moment, 
as he would travel toward Jerusalem, the city would have disappeared from view as he traveled through a low spot on the road from Emmaus. But then there was that time when he came over the, the rise of the Mount of Olives and, and, and immediately the whole city of Jerusalem came into view. If you've ever been to the Holy Land and you stand, that's where most photographs are taken of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. You see the whole city as it is today laid out. And as Jesus viewed the city, it's as if the exuberant cries of the multitudes who were crying out, Hosanna, and giving God the glory, it is as if that, that faded from his hearing because he looked upon the holy city and he wept. Verse number 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. It was just a couple of days earlier that he wept at the grave of Lazarus. And they said, behold how he loved him. And Jesus here is looking over that city of Jerusalem and he's weeping because he has seen and he knows what is to come. He was weeping over souls that were lost, that would be lost who would die and go off into a Christless eternity in a place called hell. You see, Jesus has a heart for sinners. We know that from his ministry. He mixed with sinners. He, he went to the place where people would listen to the gospel and often he was criticized by the Pharisees and the religious people for eating with sinners and publicans. But he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we see his humanity, not just the fact that he's God, but also that he's man, that he's a man who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You see, Jesus Christ is all we need in this life and beyond. And I would say you can trust him with your everlasting soul because he is God. You're putting, when you get saved, you're putting your hand, your soul, your life into his hands. That's why he said, no one is able to pluck you out of my hands because he's God. But you can also understand that he knows your fears and failures, the things that are hurting you. Jesus is a man and he can understand the feelings of our infirmities. And so we can come boldly to him before the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. What a wonderful savior we have. What a wonderful savior. He alone is worthy of our absolute trust and obedience, don't you think? I believe that's the case. And here in Luke chapter 19, he is the promised Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's talking about the messianic credentials. You see, that's very, very important. And Jesus here reveals that he is the Messiah. He fits all of the uh, expectations that were given in the word of God. The second thing I want us to look at is the response of the people to the Messiah. And I see, again, I see four different responses here. Uh, first of all, we see, and I've mentioned this, the response of his disciples. Uh, these men who had uh, been with him for uh, quite a number of years and, and they'd heard him teach and they were following him. In verse number 32 of Luke chapter 19, and they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And uh, they went their way. Uh, again, I say there was no questioning here. There, there was no saying, well, Lord, I think that's not the best idea. Why can't we do it this way? You know, we Christians, we can be very good at directing the Lord. And, uh, and God, when he wants to do something in our life, uh, we can step away and, and not actually do what he wants us to do. We, we think we have a better way. I'll tell you, God's way is always the best way and we need to listen. Jesus, you know, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, question my commandments. And, uh, and so we find here a, a response from the disciples. Uh, they, uh, they said to the, to the man, the men who owned the, 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 the beast, they, they, they said what they were told to say. And, you know, we've been given a message to say, right? Right. Uh, we don't need to modify the gospel. We just need to preach the gospel. Uh, he said, when, you, when they say, why are you taking it? You tell them this. And the same thing today, we have a command from the Lord. What does this teach us? 
you and I who are his disciples. You're following Christ? What does it say? I think it says something here in the response. Secondly, we see the response of the owners of the cult. In verse 33 and verse 34, as they were loosing the cult, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the cult? They said, The Lord hath need of him. And that was it. There was no further questioning. Uh, and, and I mentioned before, they may well have been disciples. One thing they did uh, indicate in this response is that they understood that everything that they possessed really belongs to God. Now, we're, we're living in a very materialistic world, don't you think? I mean, we have all kinds of things. And how do we look at those things that God has blessed us with, things that are not, uh, not normal for other parts of the world? We, we have those. And uh, we take them for granted, but, you know, all the times we say, well, that's mine and that's mine. You know, the Christian attitude here is to understand and recognize that God gives us all of that. It's, it's from his hand. And everything that we have, everything that we own, really belongs to the Lord. And, and I think that was the attitude here of the owners of the, this little uh, 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 young donkey here, that uh, it's, if, it's, if it's, the Lord has need of it, that's his. How would we respond if the Lord spoke to our hearts and says, I have need of this? Well, I'll tell you, in the early church, we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. There was a time when the church in Jerusalem was going through difficulty and people were going without, and so the, the other believers who had uh, land and possessions, they said, okay, it's the Lord's anyway. That's the attitude here. That's the response that we notice with the owners of the cult. The uh, third group of people are the multitudes. Verse number 37, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Um, you know, most of these people living on the slopes of the Mount of Olives and down in the Valley of Kidron and all around Jerusalem, most of these were pilgrims that had come down from Galilee and other parts for the Passover. And, uh, of course, they had known many of the things that Jesus had done in the past. But there were others who were from nearby. Uh, we read in John chapter 12 and verse 17, after Jesus uh, uh, had raised Lazarus from the dead, a mighty miracle. This is just a, a day or two before. The Bible says, The people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. I mean, they were praising God. They were witnessing to the fact that Jesus had done mighty miracles. And so as we see this great multitude of people, here they are crying out, Hosanna, uh, which means save now. They were crying out, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This was a day of great praise and they were letting it rip. It must have been quite a sight. You know, I find one of the most insulting myths that is bandied about by a lot of preaching and a lot of books about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly his trial. Uh, maybe you've read it, maybe you've thought, that, well, that's how it was, that these, the, the, the narrative is, I think it's a false narrative, is that these very people who were crying out Hosanna and praising God and welcoming Jesus and and casting their garments on the road and uh, showering him with palm branches. And it was just such a wonderful thing that this, these same people were the ones who turned on him and his trial and they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. I, I think that's a terrible thing to say about God's people, don't you? You know, if you read the scriptures, you'll find that they had a hard time finding anybody uh, in Mark 15 the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Bar Barabbas unto them and Pilate answered and said again unto them what will ye then that I should do unto him 
whom you call the king of the Jews. They cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, crucify him. But you know, the fact is that uh, they had a hard time finding anyone who could stand against Jesus. Um, In uh, Matthew 26, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. They couldn't even get anyone to tell a lie about Jesus. Though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At last came two false witnesses. So this idea that these wonderful believers who were out there singing praises and welcoming Jesus in four day or three days' time, they turned on him and cried out, crucify him, crucify him. I don't think that's true at all. The, the, the people that cried that out were the religious people and the ones that uh, the chief priests and the elders could kind of whip up into a frenzy and try to get uh, Pilate to change his mind. Now these people here and the people who welcomed Jesus coming down from the Mount of Olives and, and across the, the Kidron Valley and ascending up into Jerusalem, these people were the lepers that had been healed. These people were the blind who'd been made to see and the lame who'd been able to walk and the deaf and the possessed. They were sinners. They were the company of the redeemed. That's just like you and me. We're the company of the redeemed, are we not? So let it rip. Give praises to the Lord. That's, that was the reaction here. They cried, save now. If you look over in Psalm 118... You'll notice in verse 25, save now. That's the meaning of the word Hosanna. Save now. I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. These people not only praised God, but they knew what he was there to do. They they knew what Jesus had come to do because they'd heard the gospel. They knew that he was coming to bear our sins on the cross. Well, we see the reaction of the disciples of Jesus. We see the reaction of the owners of the cult. And now we, and we see the reaction of the great crowd of people. But then lastly, we see the religious leaders and their reaction. Look at ver- back in Luke 19, look at verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from them, from among the multitude, said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You know, the plans of the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, um, and the chief priests, their plan at this point was to arrest Jesus the moment he stepped foot inside Jerusalem. And the noise of this jubilant crowd was stymieing Uh, their machinations, their plans to do just that. How could they arrest Jesus when everyone was crying out to praise God for him? Now these men, these Pharisees in the multitude, they were spies. They were sent there to infiltrate. Uh, They didn't do it in a balloon, but they did infiltrate the the, uh, crowds there to report on what Jesus was doing and uh, sending the messages back trying to come up with something that they could charge him for. And they realized that we've got to silence this multitude because uh, there's no way we can arrest Jesus when he's so popular. So they said, Jesus, you need to tell them to hush. <laughs> I love what he said. You know, if I told them to hush, they probably would obey me, but then the stones, the very rocks, would start crying out. All creation is praising God. But religion, you see what religion tries to do, even to this day, is to exalt man. And in doing so, lessening the claims of Jesus Christ and all that he stands for. So we can observe in this amazing scene of the presentation of Jesus Christ as he came to present himself as their Messiah. We can learn a lot from the reactions of people, but, you know, it's not a matter of learning a lot, but it's saying, how would I react? How do I react today as Jesus comes to me every day through the word of God? How do I respond as a Christian? Am I truly a disciple of the Lord following him? Am I obedient to his commands? 
Am I doing what he wants? And am I giving praise to the Lord, giving him the glory for all that he does in my life? Because really, it's all because of him. Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm, and you may have picked up there, uh, particularly from verse 22, uh, some things that we read about here in Luke 19, but also in other parts of the New Testament. Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner. You know, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of Bible Baptist Church. Uh, the chief cornerstone means everything stems and starts with him, and uh, he is the foundation of this church. And uh, we are uh, subject to Christ. He's the head of this church. I'm not the head of the church, and we all yield to the authority of our Lord. And the stone which the builders refused, the, the Jews would refuse him. They would crucify him. But it, he has become the head of the corner. And listen, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. This, this account in Luke chapter 19 was not an accidental uh, event. It was something that was planned from eternity past that Jesus would come to present himself as the Lamb of God and would die for our sins. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. And then verse 25, save now, Hosanna. I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I want you to mark the words of Jesus in Luke 19, 42. As he wept over the city, he said this, if thou hadst known, if thou hadst known, even thou at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Oh, what a lament that is. What a, what a cry it is. If thou hast known, if only you knew. For three and a half years I've been going about preaching the gospel. If only you knew the things that belong to your peace. Remember when our Lord was, was born, the, the angel uh, said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. And Jesus came to bring peace Peace with God, first of all, and then the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And Jesus, as he wept over that city, he said, If only you knew that this is the day, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace. At least in this day, he said, what he's saying is, you should know what the Bible says about me. That great prophecy in the book of Daniel, Daniel 9, 26, and after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The Bible spoke of this event, of this day that he would come, he would be cut off. He didn't die for his own sins, but he would die for all of our sins. And if only you knew, if only you could open your eyes. You know, we deal with people all the time today, don't we? We want to share the good news of Christ. We want to tell them what it means to, to, to have the assurance of salvation to have your sins forgiven and, and so often it's it's a blindness there and if only they knew we feel like saying that to them don't we psalm 8, 118 verse 27 god is the lord which hath showed us light and then notice this statement there bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar bind the sacrifice you know jesus came to be the sacrifice for our sins. And as it was in the Old Testament days when the sacrifice was put on the brazen altar, there were four horns that came out of each corner and they would bind the sacrifice so that it wouldn't get off the altar. Its, its uh, destiny, its fate was sealed. And Jesus came and yes, he could have called on 12 legions of angels. He could have destroyed the world. He could have put an end to it, but... He was bound to the altar. And we see that he has bound it with the cords of love that kept him steadfast. And he went to the cross. He died for us. And the psalmist recorded that, bind the cords, bind the sacrifice with cords. That's what Jesus came to do. On that day when he presented himself to Israel, he was coming to fulfill the plan of God. 
Well, I wonder where we would stand among the throngs of people on that Sabbath day. Would you stand there as an obedient disciple, praising your Savior all the day long? Or would you be more like the religious as kind of mocking this idea of Jesus coming and mocking God's word and mocking God's son and God's salvation? Are you blinded to the truth as these Jews were? You know, our message is simply this, that we preach to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Christ. That's our message today. This morning, if you know in your own heart that you're not saved, that you've never had a time in your life where you called upon Jesus Christ to save your soul. I'm telling you, he still holds open the door of salvation, the way of salvation for you. You can be saved today. I want to challenge each of us who know Christ that we would be true disciples. True disciples are those who are obedient to what he wants. So often we fall into the trap of doing what we want and putting God in a sort of a place of convenience. When it's okay to fit him in, I'll do so, but I'm, I've got my own life to live. We ought to reverse that. Maybe today that's what you need to do is reverse that and submit to the lordship of Christ in your life. If you're not saved, I urge you to do something about it. The Bible says that if we would confess, believe in our heart, that God hath raised him from the dead and confess with the mouth that that, uh, we call upon the Lord to save us, he'll do just that. He keeps his promises and he's able to save.